Welcome again. My name is Stu McKenzie. I'm the Science Manager with the Criminal Investigations and Network Analysis, or CNA Center, hosted here at George Mason University. Um, we're very glad you could join us online today for another socially distant presentation in our full series of insights into transnational organized crime. If you're interested, please do join us on November 11th. We'll be hosting a talk by Martin Bouchard on network data and gangs. Uh, like today's presentation, I think that's going to be fascinating. Um, so to stay informed, please sign up for our mailing list if you're not on it already. Um, you can find additional detail on this and other upcoming events and activities on our website. We're privileged to welcome two guest speakers this afternoon, uh, Lily Richardson and Jenny Mossbacher from LegitScript. Uh, a company whose mission is to make the internet and payment ecosystem safer and more transparent. Um, Lily is a program manager who runs a team working on e-commerce merchant risk and transaction laundering, and she focuses on the intersection between cybercrime and money laundering. Uh, Jenny, too, is a program manager uh, overseeing investigations teams that specialize in transaction laundering detection and mapping out online criminal networks. Um, Lily and Jenny have very kindly agreed to share some fresh perspectives today on ways in which criminal organizations conduct transaction laundering, how their strategies change dynamically over time, and also some pros and cons of different methods of detection. Uh, the title of their talk this afternoon is Transaction Laundering and the Facilitation of Cybercrime Through the Online Payment Ecosystem. Um, ladies, we're absolutely thrilled to host you this afternoon. Thank you for sharing your expertise with the group. And if you're ready, I will hand over to you guys for your presentation. Thanks so much, Stu. We are ready. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Stu, for the warm introduction. And thank you so much to Sina for inviting us to speak with you today. Uh, We'd also like to thank Sarah and Carrie uh, at Sina for your help in coordinating this. Uh, we're extremely excited to be here to talk about one of our favorite topics, which is transaction laundering and the role that it plays in enabling cybercrime. Um, my name is Lily Richardson. I'm a program manager, uh, as Stu said, for merchant monitoring at LegitScript. Uh, so providing merchant risk analysis and transaction laundering detection for payment processors. Uh, my background is in doing cybercrime investigative work um, and network mapping uh, for our government agency clients. And before that, a background in anti-money laundering investigations. And I am Jenny Mossbacher, also a program manager uh, with our merchant investigations teams. Like Lily, uh, I got started as an investigative analyst uh, working uh, with our government agency partners and then moved on to the payment side. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with LegitScript, we wanted to give a bit of background about who we are um, and our experience with cybercrime and online payments risk analysis. Our mission is to make the internet and payment ecosystem safer and more transparent. To achieve this, we provide cybercrime analysis, monitoring, and investigation across various sectors. Our clients include government agencies, internet platforms, merchant acquirers, and others. Uh, this gives us a really multi-dimensional understanding into illegal and high-risk activity online, uh, and this multifaceted approach enables us to quickly identify trends and stop illicit activity sometimes before it even starts. For example, if we see a bad actor operating on an e-commerce platform, we are then aware of that actor and watching and ready if they attempt to apply for a merchant account in one of our clients' portfolios. Our monitoring encompasses more than 60 high-risk areas with some form of monitoring in more than 100 countries and more than 15 languages. We're always adapting and adding new risk areas uh, over time. Uh, for example, earlier this year, we began actively monitoring for scams and fraud related to the COVID-19 pandemic, which unfortunately has been quite prolific. Uh, and although these categories are very different, what you'll see in today's presentation is that the techniques used for transaction laundering across many of these high-risk categories can be very similar. So, Cybercrime doesn't solely occur online, uh, but relies on various interlocking components, both on and offline, in order to function. This includes things like internet infrastructure, payment processing, shipping and business logistics, and many other components. So today we'll focus in on detecting and prevent preventing transaction laundering, which is a practice that enables people engaged in all kinds of risky to illegal activity to covertly gain access to the financial system. 
We'll focus first on where credit card payments fit into the picture of cybercrime and then how transaction laundering creates a way into the system for those bad actors who want to offer credit card payments to their customers. We'll also dig into what it takes to detect, track, and prevent this activity, uh, which will include some content area trends, commonly seen typologies, and a case study of a larger scale, more organized effort to create a market for transaction laundering accounts. We'll talk about some of what we see happening in those marketplaces, as well as how merchants ad adapt when they are detected doing this. Uh, at this point, I'll hand it over to Jenny to talk about uh, credit card payments and where transaction laundering fits in. Awesome. Thanks, Lily. Uh, before we get right into the transaction laundering, first, we're going to take a look at the online payments ecosystem and how it works. So in 2020, e-commerce makes up about 14.5% of all retail sales in the U.S., which is a value of nearly $710 billion. The global market right now is valued at about $4.13 trillion. So more than ever, commerce is happening online. Uh, definitely right now that we've been at home during quarantine, uh, online sales uh, have grown uh, as a result of that. Financial crime, as Lily said, um, happens on and off the internet, but the internet does make it very easy to perpetuate because of the, in, the anonymity that comes with being online. And then also the easy access to services for the operators end, and then the easy access to customers. We often say that illicit sellers are rational economic actors, but what does that actually mean? It means that the merchant, irrespective of what they're selling, is striving to succeed in business. So they're going to make the best possible decisions they can in order to ensure that their business thrives. So illicit merchants have similar needs to genuine merchants, including good marketing, a strong sales infrastructure, which means everything from your website build out to your payment acceptance to your uh, fulfillment strategies. There's sometimes a misconception that all illicit activity online happens on the dark web, which just simply isn't true uh, because most people don't go to the dark web or even really know how to access it. The extra layer of anonymity that the dark web provides makes it really rife with fraudsters. <clears throat> if I'm a consumer looking to buy something online, even if it's illegal, I want the same consumer guarantees that I get with buying anything else. So I want to use my credit card in case I need to cancel the order, initiate a chargeback, or report fraud. And I want the shopping experience to be smooth and pleasant. So the majority of illicit e-commerce takes place on the clear web, which is the internet that all of us know and use, because bad actors need to attract customers. So it kind of follows the old sales adage of you have to fish where the fishes are. So there are going to be many ways to process payments online, but credit cards are the gold standard, and that is why bad actors want to use them. There are going to be some exceptions to this. So there are cases where more anonymized methods, such as cryptocurrency or semi-anonymized methods, such as gift cards, may be more valuable to a consumer looking to cover their tracks. But generally speaking, the friendlier the payment method is, the more consumers that can be reached. So lacking credit card processing, illicit merchants are forced to offer payment options that are far less desirable for them and the consumer. I mean, when was the last time that you bought something online with cash? Probably never. Uh, and then there are other more difficult ways of transferring money, like wire transfers, uh, e-checks or ACH, uh, which are inconvenient for both the consumer and for the merchant uh, because they tend to be expensive and inconvenient uh, and also requires often the exchange of banking information that is not going to uh, be something you're going to want to do, especially if you're buying something that is maybe unsavory. Uh, cryptocurrency and peer-to-peer -peer options uh, certainly have a lot of anonymity, which might be good if you're buying something illicit, uh, but are still inconvenient because there is an, a trust that needs to occur between the merchant and the buyer. And so if you don't have that, again, especially if you're buying something that maybe is a little sketchy, uh, you're going to want the guarantee of uh, consumer safety that an anonymized form of payment is not going to be able to provide. So uh, we looked online and found a selection of quotes that we pulled from a few users of an online forum for discussing black hat marketing techniques. 
the users are trying to obtain credit card processing and complaining about how their customers won't want to use other payment methods, such as cryptocurrencies and e-checks. Uh, in cases where an illicit merchant needs to offer non-credit card payments, they'll often have to incentivize customers with significant discounts or bonuses. So you can see one of them is very upset that most people don't even know what Bitcoin BTC is, let alone how it is that they would be able to use it to purchase something. So from the consumer's perspective, credit cards are going to be the best and easiest way to pay for online purchases. But in order for a seller to accept credit card payments, they need to have a merchant account, which can be a somewhat complex process because of the institutions involved. This flowchart is uh, admittedly a very, very simplified version of the credit card payment ecosystem. Um, but basically, a merchant obtains an account from a processor. And payment processor uh, is going to be a pretty umbrella term here that can mean everything from um, like a merchant acquirer, a payment facilitator, an ISO, an agent. Uh, they're going to be sponsored by an upstream acquiring bank. So that is where the money is going to go. And then uh, there also has to be a line to the credit card network. So uh, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, uh, where the transactions are actually going to be conducted. Of course, uh, we have a lot of regulatory oversight over everything. So banks themselves are subject to regulatory oversight and anti-money laundering statutes as well as the rules set by the actual card brands for use of their networks. And then of course, uh, law enforcement to ensure that everyone uh, is acting legally. And broadly, card networks are going to prohibit illegal activity, but then unlike uh, government regulators or law enforcement, they may also enforce specific rules against high-risk merchant activity that is not necessarily illegal, uh, such as business models that can trigger significant chargebacks. So, of course, the payment ecosystem is designed to detect and prevent illegal or otherwise prohibited activity. Uh, that goes without saying, but we're saying it anyway. Illicit actors that are barred from accessing payment processing capabilities can attempt to circumvent these compliance controls through transaction laundering. Uh, so historically, if uh, someone wanted to open a merchant account, they would have to establish a relationship with a banking institution and there would be a substantial underwriting process involved to vet the individual and or their business prior to receiving the ability to process cards. Banks and downstream payment partners are required to perform KYC, which is know your customer. Uh, they have to do those checks before enabling merchants to use their services. Uh, this method had been a really good way to ensure that you're always going to onboard trustworthy merchants, uh, but it takes time and resources on behalf of both the bank and the merchant. And it's also not 100% uh, guaranteed that a big underwriting process is always going to ensure that you are keeping out illicit actors. So at a high level, transaction laundering is a way to game the payments compliance system. In many ways, this is analogous to more traditional forms of money laundering, where you'd have a front company posing as a genuine business that isn't actually selling anything and the payments that it's taking are actually for something else. So I think everyone has experienced uh, a situation where you're walking down the street and you has a storefront that just never seems to be open or has no customers and maybe just sells kind of weird stuff that nobody wants. Uh, it's possible that you might just be walking by effectively a front for illicit activity that is not actually meant to cater to the public. So the increased volume and speed of e-commerce right now has given rise to uh, something we refer to as frictionless onboarding. So this simplifies uh, and quickens that onboarding process that I discussed. So it enables people to obtain merchant accounts quicker with minimal information about them and their business uh, required upfront to get started. So this is really good news for people who are looking for a really quick and painless way to get set up with selling online, uh, but can also, as a result, increase that risk of abuse. And transaction laundering is going to be challenging to detect even with more thorough underwriting processes, but this expedited and frictionless onboarding makes it easier for illicit actors to exploit the credit card payments ecosystem. 
So now that we have a broad understanding of what transaction laundering is, well, who does it? I mean, in short, it's any merchant who is processing transactions for something that they want to hide. Uh, that means that these transactions can range in severity, like not all the products are going to be overtly illegal, but may fall into categories that are deemed risky by payment processors and therefore sale may be restricted by a processor's terms and conditions or require expensive registration or uh, regulation to be sold. Um, an example of this is uh, a, like a high risk area, which would be gambling, which is certainly legal in many cases, but is also subject to uh, many complex jurisdictional regulations. Illicit merchants can range from being sole proprietors acting alone to massive organized transnational criminal networks. So uh, <laughs> this is uh, a non-exhaustive accounting of <laughs> a few examples of products sold by merchants that we have found to be engaged in transaction laundering. Uh, as you can see, not all the products are gonna be illegal per se, uh, but as soon as a merchant is engaging in transaction laundering, which is basically then money laundering, they start to pose a, a more outsized risk to the integrity of the payments ecosystem because of that behavior. So they have effectively uh, made the situation more illegal and worse for them, uh, whether, you know, even if they're selling something that is as seemingly innocuous as like CBD. So now that we've talked about transaction laundering uh, in a more general sense, I'm going to turn it over to Lily, who is going to uh, enlighten us with some risk indicators we can look for in this case. So from the perspective of a payment processor, all of this raises the question of how do you manage this risk? How do you uncover these transaction laundering accounts that are lurking in your payment portfolio? Uh, there are a few different angles to this, but the, the very first one we'll discuss is um, the website. So this is a great point to start with because providing a website is usually a key component if you are attempting to obtain an e-commerce merchant account. Uh, analyzing the website can provide really significant clues and risk indicators regarding whether or not the business is what it says it is. So the most important principle is understanding what a genuine online business would do, which is anything and everything that it can do to attract and retain customers. If you have set up a transaction laundering website, your website's goal is to provide cover to you, not to attract customers or run a business. Uh, so one of the first broad indicators we'd look for is uh, how does the website look? Is the merchant using a, a template-based website without much modification? Uh, do they have a lack of care for their external presentation to customers? This could include things like really just sloppy, incomplete, or typo-written website copy, incongruous product images, unusual product pricing. Um, but it goes beyond that, too. Uh, another thing that we'd want to look for is looking at the website's dynamic features. Uh, if a website is selling clothing, does it allow you to select multiple sizes? Does it tell you how it's going to fit? Um, Another component too is that in this day and age, most e-commerce businesses will likely have some sort of promotional presence on social media or general greater internet presence. Um, it's not enough to just create those social media pages. Uh, we'd wanna ask, do they appear genuine? Do they have user engagement? Does the user engagement appear genuine since that is not a guarantee? Uh, and with all these considerations in mind, we can start to make headway on an assessment of the website. Um, there are some obvious limitations here, though. Uh, for example, there are a lot of sloppy, unfinished e-commerce websites on the internet. And of course, most of them are simply that, sloppy websites. They aren't transaction laundering fronts. Uh, to return to Jenny's example of the weird, never open storefront, probably most of those places are not nefarious money laundering fronts, but probably just operated pe by people who don't have a lot of business savvy. Um, so this is a great starting point, but we need to narrow it down a little further in order to, um, to really analyze this. So the next thing that we can look at is the business model, looking at business models that are more likely to be abused. Uh, certain types of business models are just easier to exploit for this. The first that I would point to is drop shipping, which has become an enormously popular e-commerce business model in recent years in which effectively anyone can create an online store and outsource the inventory, shipping, and warehousing to a third party. 
Uh, these businesses pose various types of risk, not the least of which is chargebacks, since customers often don't get products delivered or receive something substandard uh, if they do get a product delivered. Uh, but dropshipping websites also provide many, many highly customal, customizable website templates and configuration options, allowing someone who is relatively non-tech savvy to create a relatively professional looking website. Other types of potentially high risk business models include uh, service based businesses that are not selling a physical product. Uh, there are an abundance of plug and play website templates for these business types and user reviews can be very easy to fabricate. Uh, these can include generic technical and professional services, things like web design, SEO or graphic design. Uh, another pro of these business models from a transaction launderer's perspective is that uh, they can essentially charge whatever they say is reasonable, and it's plausible for them to issue recurring charges if the underlying illegal business is likely to issue recurring charges. That is a um, that is a plus from their perspective. Um, and part of the reason all these business models are so exploitable is just that there is a huge market out there of highly customizable website templates um, that can just appear very realistic um, without a lot of effort. Uh, so if our analysis of a website's functionality indicates that it poses risk for transaction laundering, where do we go from there? We can say that it poses some risk, but how do we take it to the next level where we understand what they're really doing? Uh, we have to move on to a network mapping analysis wherein we see if the website is connected to anything else of note. Doing this type of analysis can start with open source information alone. Um, the, the easiest place to start, of course, is looking at the published contact information on the merchant's website, seeing if it shows up elsewhere. Other points of inquiry can include website technical data um, and internet infrastructure, since it's not uncommon for merchants to reuse the same services for their transaction laundering websites, as well as those offering violative products. People offering, people in general are creatures of habit and will often rely on the same service providers and setup options. Uh, without getting too much into the details, we can use and cross-reference these common data points to uh, provide a bigger picture of what else the merchant might be connected to. Uh, lastly, if you have if you are in the position, and of course not everyone is, to have access to merchant application details uh, that the merchant themselves provides to the, their payment processor, this is hugely valuable data. Uh, many merchants are unaware or um, just not aware of the consequences of the fact that investigators might have visibility into this data um, and can leave very obvious clues there as to what they're up to, or. Uh, little tidbits that can be cross-referenced with other intel. Um, additionally, certain types of data points that would be included there, uh, particularly things like physical addresses and phone or fax numbers, may be harder for the merchant to change, so they're more likely to reappear across multiple merchant applications. So set, looking at the website is a great starting point, and setting up websites for transaction laundering is certainly set central to the practice of doing transaction laundering. Uh, but something that's very important to note is that there is not always going to be a one-to-one -one mapping of a bad website to a transaction laundering website. Uh, if we focus on those website-to-website -website connections, uh, that will be hugely important, but it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution. In many cases, the underlying operators that we're seeing here don't run a website at all, but um, perhaps are doing something and then obtaining customers' credit card numbers over the phone. It could be through text or email solicitations. Um, then once they have that credit card information, running the credit card somewhere else. This could be a physical point of sale terminal uh, or an online payment acceptance dashboard for their business, uh, not necessarily th directly through a website. Another method we see often is transaction laundering through invoicing. Merchants will create invoices through electronic invoicing tools and then email them to the customer. Uh, another angle of transaction laundering, which we'll discuss more as we go on, is that merchants can provide applications to the payment processor that have falsified URLs or other details or even are set up using a stolen identity. In those cases, it's not enough to just analyze the website because it may be a completely genuine e-commerce website that is not in fact controlled by the underlying operator of the account. Um, 
So certain types of transaction laundering fronts may be more likely to be associated with certain types of violative activity. Uh, the main reason for this is to keep the transaction process running smoothly and looking genuine, uh, not only to the payment provider, but also to the consumer. Because if the consumer is buying some sort of illicit product and then sees an unusual or silly charge come through on their bank statement, they are much more likely to call their bank and ask questions or initiate a chargeback. And for the merchant, chargebacks are going to bring extremely unwanted attention. So it's important from the perspective of these illicit actors to obtain sort of a, a transaction model and a merchant descriptor. That would be the descriptor that appears on your card statement that are plausibly related to the underlying business in some way without giving away what it really is. So a great example of that would be uh, that internet pharmacies that are operating egregiously illegally. So these would be uh, businesses that are offering prescription drugs that are unapproved for sale uh, without a valid prescription and are unlicensed. Uh, in these cases, it's quite common to use uh, health and wellness related websites as transaction laundering fronts, uh, offering perhaps lower risk seeming products like supplements or cosmetics. Uh, this particular example of a very innocuous looking cosmetics website was in fact engaged in transaction laundering on behalf of a rogue internet pharmacy offering prescription drugs, including controlled substances via email solicitations. Another area where we see uh, transaction laundering occur quite frequently is in IP infringing IPTV services. So these are services that are going to offer uh, unauthorized access to streaming copyrighted content. Um, they offer subs paid subscriptions to users. And most of these services operate on our reseller model, meaning there are a huge amount of people involved. And so that means there are a huge number of storefronts involved uh, with varying degrees of sophistication. Uh, so many of these monthly TV subscriptions are relying on servers that host the content um, and bill their customers monthly or quarterly. So the perfect logical front for this is web hosting, uh, offering access to monthly web hosting charges. Uh, oftentimes in less sophisticated cases, the violative website will simply auto redirect to, um, to a web hosting page at checkout um, in a very straightforward form of transaction laundering. Online gambling, uh, which is highly regulated and in some cases can be illegal uh, and itself just poses a level of inherent money laundering risk is also a space where transaction laundering is employed. Uh, a common type of laundering seen with gambling merchants is the use of intermediary payment forms or payment aggregation methods to obscure illicit transactions. Uh, in many cases, gambling, uh, online gambling is difficult because it can be legal in certain countries, but not legal in others. And perhaps some operators want to covertly offer access in a country where they aren't allowed to. In cases like that, uh, they may direct users to pay for something like an e-voucher or will route them through a cryptocurrency exchange that takes payments via card. Uh, it's not unusual in those cases to see a highly integrated payment flow. That is upon attempting a deposit on a gambling website with a card, we would be redirected to a cryptocurrency exchange for the same amount and then routed back to the gambling website when the exchange is complete. Uh, although it is possible that in some of these cases, these are like genuine large third party uh, cryptocurrency marketplaces. In many cases with gambling, these are going to be purpose driven integrations specifically for processing these types of payments. Another area with significant transaction laundering risk is negative option billing. So these will be cases where um, merchants are effectively engaged in uh, recurring subscription models where, for example, you might think that you are getting a free trial of some supplements, but instead you end up enrolled in a very expensive monthly subscription uh, that is very difficult to impossible to unenroll yourself from. Uh, it is perhaps not surprising that this business model uh, causes consumers to initiate a lot of chargebacks because they do not like having these uh, charges imposed upon them. Uh, and so one way that uh, that these merchants will circumvent uh, circumvent these chargeback controls is by creating a whole arsenal of accounts that effectively check all the boxes for onboarding, but um, 
that they have like the company name on the website. They have that they have all of the required components, but they're offering the they're offering just like a single product in like a very bland way that no reasonable person would probably ever want to buy. Um, and then they can use all of these accounts that they've created to load balance their transactions um, to avoid hitting a chargeback detection threshold on any particular account, all while obscuring the fact that what they're really doing is engaging in these recurring billing practices, which are usually going to be either highly restricted or prohibited by payment processors. So now Jenny will talk us through some examples of transaction laundering typologies in action. Thanks, Elaine. Um, so this is going to discuss uh, more of the general operational behavior that we see with transaction launderers uh, now that we have an understanding of some of the content areas and some of those patterns. Uh, so this first typology is the vertically integrated transaction laundering format. So your more like entrepreneurial illicit merchants may just decide to take transaction laundering into their own hands by setting up their own bank pages, which are aka uh, bogus transaction laundering websites, marketing innocuous goods. However, uh, sometimes these merchant uh, these merchants are not super smart and will submit account information that is all in their real name or their business name. As Lily had noted earlier, uh, sometimes there are just uh, instances where merchants uh, have to provide genuine information and maybe don't have access to anything else. So they're just going to use their own name and then try to obscure the connection between uh, their innocuous front business and then their illicit activity. So in this particular uh, case that we have the screenshots for, uh, this uh, person was marketing modafinil on a, an internet pharmacy site. Uh, modafinil is a controlled substance and funneled transactions through a succession of accounts with nearly identical identifying information, including uh, his own name. Uh, as we continue to shut down account after account, he eventually recruited his friend's identities once it became evident that he could no longer make accounts under his own name. Uh, the funny part of this was that he and his friends all live in a small town uh, with a distinct name, which gave us a very clear data point to uh, look for and track as new accounts were created. Even in absence of the recycled merchant application information, this merchant engaged in other pattern behaviors that we can look for uh, when trying to suss out transaction laundering, such as using the same IP address to host all of his bank page websites. So on one hand, it sounds like that this is kind of amateur hour for this particular merchant. We do see these kinds of um, human behavioral patterns, even when applied on a grander scale. So at one point, we had tracked a cluster of transaction laundering websites connected to a large criminal internet pharmacy network via the repurposing of the same shelf name on the contact pages of all of their transaction laundering websites. So the next form of transaction laundering is when we get into the idea of transaction laundering as a service and things start to get a lot trickier uh, as we are trying to track them down. So these types of transaction laundering accounts uh, are referred to as stealth accounts as it's an easy way to launder under the radar. Sellers of stealth accounts will often boast that they offer them aged, which is to say that they were created long ago with just enough transaction volume so that they carry less suspicion in a merchant portfolio than a freshly made account that suddenly has a lot of transaction volume. So if stealth is the intention of these accounts, then synthetic is the methodology. So these merchant accounts are created with stolen information. We refer to them as being synthetic accounts because the personal identifying information is usually a mix of random dates of birth, social security numbers, um, EINs or like business tax IDs and address information that doesn't necessarily align with any one real person. But information is usually coming from like data dumps that you can find online from a variety of online breaches. Uh, people will make these stealth accounts with synthetic identities in bulk and then sell them on forums and other purpose-built platforms. 
An example of a synthetic identity seller getting in serious trouble for his work is the case of Robert Pinedo, who was swept up in the Mueller investigation. Pinedo had, broken, had brokered stolen bank account information through his company called Auction eAssistance to aid people who were unable to obtain PayPal and eBay accounts. Some of that banking information that he sold was used in the creation of fraudulent PayPal accounts by the Kremlin-linked Internet Research Agency, who in turn used those accounts to buy Facebook ads fueling their disinformation campaign. So Pinedo had claimed uh, that he had no knowledge of what people were using the bank account information for, which is certainly quite possible, but definitely did not absolve him of his role in facilitating crime. And then we have a case of identity theft that unfortunately is a little more willing in some case. Uh, we've seen examples of people being recruited as part of IBO schemes, which is independent business owners uh, who are conned into lending their identities in the creation of LLCs uh, that are then used so merchants can obtain accounts for processing. IBOs are promised passive income in the form of commissions on sales from these merchants, but the IBOs that are involved in the scheme don't necessarily have visibility or a lot of understanding into what the accounts are actually being used for. Uh, we often see uh, IBOs that are targeting uh, vulnerable populations of U.S. citizens, such as uh, the elderly or other fixed or low income individuals. Uh, IBO schemes also tend to uh, happen in like familial clusters. So one person gets swept up into it and then they start to recruit their friends and family as well. And then we have thankfully a, a slightly rarer form of transaction laundering, which is that of the complicit payment processor. Uh, so these, this would be a payment processor that would knowingly process payments on behalf of fraud merchants. So a high profile example of this would be a 2019 FTC complaint that alleged that payment processor Allied Wallet had knowingly facilitated payments for merchants engaged in fraudulent activities such as pyramid schemes, um, predatory debt collection, and business coaching scams. The complaint detailed allegations that Allied and its affiliate businesses aided in the creation of foreign shell companies to act as those merchants of record for these transactions and had even created fake, fake bank pages for them. So this is certainly going to be the extreme end of payment processor bad behavior. Uh, more often, we see instances where payment processors and acquirers will just fail to perform due diligence. Uh, and ignore clear evidence of fraud to allow merchants to continue operating in the face of excessive chargebacks or suspicious activity. So now that we have uh, an understanding of the content areas and the types of transaction laundering behavior, uh, Lily is gonna start us off with uh, leading us through this case study of transaction laundering. So this is a case where uh... A single transaction laundering investigation into a single merchant led to a large scale discovery of a transaction laundering network. Uh, much in the way that your email address will probably get sold to email marketers if you give it out to too many stores. The same thing will happen if you end up using the same unattributable email address on various less excellent websites. Uh, so at some point in time at an unattribu unattributable email address, I began receiving emails uh, from uh, someone I had never heard of before offering prescription opioids and other prescription drugs for sale without a prescription, of course, uh, usually offering cash on delivery, but occasionally also offering credit card payments. Uh, so in wanting to investigate that further, uh, we engaged with the email solicitation and received a link to a website where you could actually place orders for prescription drugs. This was relatively obscured by the underlying actor in that the website displayed no content when accessed via the root domain. Uh, this product offering could only be accessed through the dedicated links that they were sending to customers through these email solicitations. Uh, so at this point, we decided to initiate an undercover test order to see what we could learn about the payment processing infrastructure. 
And so we performed a test transaction on the checkout website that we had uncovered using a trace card, uh, which is a term that we use to refer to credit cards that appear real in the processing flow, but are completely unfunded and set to decline. But because they do read as a like real card going through um, the system, it will produce information on a credit card statement that then we can use to continue our investigation. So we performed a test transaction. Uh, we received a merchant descriptor back that had unequivocally related back to this website offering cosmetics. Uh, even viewing this website in isolation, we would evaluate it as having the hallmarks of a transaction laundering website. It has all of four products listed <laughs> at somewhat weird prices, has zero user traffic, and virtually no greater internet presence or social media promotions. And the corresponding company name listed on the contact page is just a fairly generic sounding LLC. So the contact information posted on the website didn't get us that far in the investigation. The phone number didn't show up elsewhere, uh, and the company name listed had corresponded to an anonymized business registration record filed in Wyoming, so basically a dead end. However, the domain name registration details, aka the who is information of the website, listed another person and business name than the one that appeared on the website and an address in Southern California. So we performed a reverse search of the who is records that led to about two dozen other domain names registered with the same information. The majority of the associated websites had a similar look and feel to the cosmetics website. So very bare bones template pages with just like a smattering of products for show, phone numbers and strange LLC names that never matched up to anything else online. Although we couldn't confirm that all of the websites were used as bank pages for transaction laundering accounts, they are definitely at a higher risk for such use based on their content and also their association uh, via the who is with that known transaction laundering website that we had identified. Two of the domain names registered to this individual and business stood out because they did not look necessarily like transaction laundering websites on the face. Uh, one actually bore the name of the business name listed in the who is, which uh, the website promoted investment opportunities for people who would be willing to offer up their identities to be signatories for merchant accounts. So that IBO scam that I had told you about earlier. The other website, somewhat unsurprisingly, offered access to high-risk merchant accounts uh, for all manner of industries, uh, really trying to court uh, people who are clearly involved in illicit activity, suggesting that this is an integrated operation of seeking IBOs to create merchant accounts, setting up fake bank pages, and then offering the accounts to merchants looking to process cards for all manner of things, which including now to our knowledge, illicit pharmaceutical sales. So this case study is an example of how a, a transaction laundering investigation can begin uh, with a, a single email uh, or the identification of one merchant account and then spin out into this full network of illicit activity. So all of this raises the question of when we are successful and we uncover these networks of bad actors or even just help shut down individual accounts, uh, it's important to consider what the merchants do next and how they adapt to that. Um, the most basic thing that they do, uh, which we see quite often, is scramble to create more accounts. This will often involve setting up additional accounts and websites on the fly, uh, which could have, like, for example, their domain names could have very recent creation dates because they're uh, just trying to mint new websites. Uh, additionally, they can often be mapped back to those original accounts, as we've discussed earlier, through things like overlapping technical data, published contact information, or merchant application details. For merchants who are a little more professional and prepared for this, uh, also something we quite commonly see, uh, it's pretty common to set up a whole arsenal of transaction laundering accounts. They might do this through any of the techniques that we've discussed today. Um, in cases where the transaction laundering accounts have no demonstrable connection to each other, it's important to focus on that underlying violative merchant to see what they do next. Finally, it's quite common for merchants to take other payment methods as a stopgap measure to keep their business operational while they go through the process of obtaining a new merchant account. 
Uh, from what we've seen, this is almost always temporary. Uh, merchants really want to continue to take credit card payments, and they will, uh, as we showed in the screenshot earlier, incentivize consumers to use uh, less convenient payment methods with large discounts. Uh, there was one instance of an established network that had been operating for many years, offering problematic adult content that was engaged in various forms of transaction laundering, uh, taking cryptocurrency in the interim between each account that was shut down. Uh, after chasing down various iterations of this, ultimately the underlying merchant gave up and began accepting only cryptocurrency for about six straight months, after which they ceased business operations entirely, uh, which I think really demonstrates the impact that access to credit card processing can have. It can really make or break some of these businesses. To share some concluding thoughts about uh, best practices for detecting and stopping transaction laundering, uh, I think it's good to start with the core principles that we've stuck to for website analysis over the years. The first of which is step into the customer's shoes. Uh, that's always a good thing to rely on. You can't just take a, a check the box approach to compliance for merchant websites. Uh, most of these transaction laundering websites do check those onboarding boxes. Uh, it's easy enough to register a business and set up a website, but it's really those little human plausible touches of consumer friendliness that make the difference. Another principle is to consistently monitor emerging trends. The better that we get at doing this, the savvier the transaction laundering methods are going to become. It's not enough to just develop a risk framework and lean on it, but it needs to constantly evolve to stay ahead. Uh, additionally, analyzing the business model is also key. Certain business models are inherently more likely to pose risk than others. Uh, we've shared some examples of those today, and naturally, those are ever evolving as well. Finally, exploring the merchants' associations is really the linchpin of what we do and how we might be able to detect whether a website is either under common control with a violative merchant or uh, part of a ring of transaction laundering accounts. So we can learn a lot through website analysis, but as I touched on earlier, uh, in order to really get ahead of this problem, you have to view it as a much larger issue than just analyzing transaction laundering risk uh, on merchant websites. There are sort of three broad lines of research, all of which go hand in hand, which when working together uh, can be very effective in stopping transaction laundering. Uh, the first area is the one we've been really focused on, merchant onboarding and monitoring. Uh, those onboarding checks, consumer friendliness assessments, website risk analysis are all key. Uh, and we also wanna continue to monitor these merchants over time since the risk factors may evolve. Additionally, as we've mentioned, accounts can become compromised or sold, which makes it very important to closely monitor what merchants are up to, even if they initially appear to be low risk. Uh, and following the merchant's application details, website technical data, and internet infrastructure are key in identifying those connections bad to the underlying actors, which also evolve over time. That leads me to the second point, which is, in order to effectively detect transaction laundering, you also have to have a strong understanding of the underlying cyber criminal markets involved. How do these business models work and knowing who the main players are and how they typically set up their operations. Uh, I think it's really important to understand both sides of this in order to make those key connections, enabling us to detect the transaction laundering risk with a high degree of confidence. Uh, we have a lot of experience looking at both sides of the equation, and it's it's much, much easier to solve when you have a stronger understanding of who the underlying merchants are. Uh, this involves uh, investigating these websites through both more active test transactions, but also through more passive network monitoring. And as I think has become evident, there's a third entity at play here, and understanding this is key to the present and future of transaction laundering detection. So in addition to the people trying to process payments covertly and the fake accounts that are used to do so. There's a whole marketplace out there now for selling access to these accounts and websites. These marketplaces are often operating totally independently of the underlying actors, which can make them really difficult to track unless we are actively tracking these markets themselves. themselves. Uh, but if we can do that, we're going to have a huge impact because so many bad actors are using the same services that targeting these services is going to be much more effective. And across all these categories, there's a common focus in mapping out networks of bad actors. There are certainly people operating in isolation, uh, but more commonly we see larger scale concentrated efforts that can be mapped and tracked to anticipate the next move before it occurs. Uh, to share some final thoughts, uh, 
illicit e-commerce merchants are always going to be motivated to do whatever it takes to obtain quick and easy processing. It is more efficient for them to do this, and it is cheaper uh, to obtain credit card processing through transaction laundering than it is to find a payment processor who will openly tolerate uh, the activity that they are doing. Following the money and stopping the money are both important in preventing transaction laundering. Uh, what we focused on here today is really the actors themselves, not their customers. Uh, but if you're in the position of having access to transaction data, there's a whole other angle to this, which is knowing your customer's customer. Uh, who are the people who are making transactions on their website, on these websites? Uh, once we've identified that a website's engaged in transaction laundering, we suddenly will become very interested in the people who are making purchases on these websites. Those are going to be people that we want to follow too, in order to really understand the ecosystem of who is trying to get into the system and where they're showing up. Finally, uh, as transaction laundering detection improves, it's going to become less efficient for people to set this up themselves. So we expect that the marketplace for transaction laundering websites and accounts will likely grow to meet this demand. And tracking these groups is, uh, I think, key to the future of transaction laundering prevention and detection. So in a moment, we will move on to some time for questions, probably take a drink of water. Uh, while we give you time to think about that, uh, we wanted to point you to a guide that we have on transaction laundering, uh, which covers some of the topics we discussed today, but also goes into some more detail and includes eight case studies. Uh, if you would like, you can download that at legitscript.com slash Cena 2020. Again, that's legitscript.com slash Cena 2020.